Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. I am indeed very grateful to the IISS and CIISS Islamabad for honoring me once again to deliver the keynote address at the annual joint workshop of the two prestigious think tanks. The focus in these workshops remains on what I say the by now elusive strategic stability in South Asia. Unfortunately, despite the best efforts of some of the best brains in the business, South Asia has remained on a slippery slope over the years, lurching dangerously towards strategic instability rather than strategic stability. And when I use the word strategic in my address, I do not imply nuclear stability alone, but refer to the much larger and wholesome concept of strategic stability encompassing in its fold the many elements of national power and strategy. <clears throat> At the outset, I would like to begin by stating what today is a South Asian reality. The reality is that it is Pakistan that must shoulder the responsibility of maintaining the vital strategic balance in the conventional and nuclear equation with India as the critical determinant of the state of strategic stability in South Asia. If Pakistan were to allow imbalances to be introduced in the strategic equation, South Asia would list towards serious strategic instability. This in turn would lead to catastrophic consequences in view of India's historically persistent and insatiable drive for regional domination, especially given India's current irrational, unstable, and belligerent internal and external policies. By default over the decades, therefore, it has been a Pakistani responsibility not to allow the South Asian strategic stability to be disturbed to the disadvantage, despite India's repeated efforts to make it unstable. And here I would like to show with evidence that Pakistan has fulfilled its responsibility with appropriate strategic responses at every swing of the instability-stability pendulum in South Asia. Amongst many others, I will briefly recount India's seven major destabilizing strategic steps in the last 50 years, which on the average amount to one major destabilizing step every seven years, and the corresponding Pakistani response in each case to redress the instability. Case one, in the 70s, immediately after the 1971 war, India conducted its first nuclear test in May 1974, altering the tenuous strategic balance in South Asia to its advantage. While India played the farce of calling it a peaceful nuclear explosion, Pakistan responded by embarking on a nuclear weapons program of its own as the only strategic way of redressing the induced strategic instability. Pakistan succeeded in its efforts, and the rest is history. Case two. In the 80s, in 1986-87, without provocation, India massed its army and air force, complete with weapons and ammunition, on Pakistan's borders under the garb of exercise brass tacks in an operational posture threatening mainland Pakistan's north to south lines of communications in the desert sectors. In response, Pakistan not only counter-mobilized its conventional forces strongly on the international borders, but further dropped hints of a nuclear capability coming into play for the first time introducing the rudimentary concept of nuclear deterrence in South Asia as a balancing factor in a relatively asymmetrical operational environment. India blinked and strategic stability was restored. Case three. In the 90s, India upped the ante and introduced in its strategic inventory ballistic missiles Prithvi and Agni as short and medium range nuclear delivery systems covering the length and breadth of Pakistan. The resultant instability compelled Pakistan to respond through the development of the Ghaznavi, Shaheen and the Ghori ballistic missiles ensuring that the vast geographical dimensions of the Indian Peninsula came within the Pakistani strategic range. The Indian attempt to introduce strategic instability was adequately checked. Case four. <clears throat> More importantly, also in the 90s, India came out into the open and transited from a so-called peaceful nuclear state to an overt nuclear weapon state by conducting five nuclear tests in May 1998. These were followed immediately by immature political threats at responsible levels to drive home the point of the strategic balance having swung in India's favor. Pakistan's response is now part of the history of the South Asian strategic paradigm. 
Pakistan confidently responded by conducting six nuclear tests within two weeks of the Indian test and restored the strategic balance. Case five. In the first decade of this century, the Indian military, having lost the advantage of relative asymmetry in conventional forces because of Pakistan's nuclear equalizer, and also having failed to coerce Pakistan in 2001 and 2002, despite the 10 months full-scale military deployment of Operation Parakram, conceived and operationalized the provocative Cold Start Doctrine between 2005 and 2010 as a possible solution to regain the strategic advantage in a limited war scenario. It formally admitted in 2014 to the existence of the Cold Start Doctrine after 10 years state of denial. This in an environment of a nuclear overhang in South Asia in an attempt to find space for limited conventional war against an established nuclear power. In the face of this destabilizing development, Pakistan took corresponding operational, doctrinal, and force developmental measures, both in the conventional as well as nuclear fields, including the establishment of a full spectrum deterrence regime, in order to ensure that strategic stability in South Asia remained on an even keel. As a consequence, the Cold Start doctrine stayed neutralized, nuclear deterrence holds, and informed strategists consider large-scale wars on the international borders as a thing of the past. <clears throat> Case 6. In February last year, as if to maintain the dubious track record of its consistent attempts to induce strategic instability, this time linked to seeking political and electoral advantage for the BJP, India embarrassed itself by undertaking an unsuccessful air strike at Balakot in mainland Pakistan, crossing the red line of the international boundary. In the process, there was much chest thumping in the Indian strategic circles about having called Pakistan's nuclear bluff, which in my judgment was a very poor conclusion. I'll have more to say on that later. However, Pakistan Air Force responded the next day through a carefully calibrated response in two ways. First, it struck with precision the unmanned flanks of three ground targets in the Rajori sector, so as not to cause casualties, and spared the senior hierarchy of the Indian military present at one of the targets. Second, the PF humiliated the Indian Air Force by shooting down two IEF fighters and capturing one pilot, not to mention the IEF's fratricide in shooting down one of its own helicopters, resulting in seven deaths. The two actions drove home the point strongly that Pakistan would ever forever continue to disallow strategic instability to become a norm. Strategic stability was restored and no new normal was allowed to prevail. Case 7. <clears throat> A point that runs as a scarlet thread through the last five decades as a constant is the fact of large-scale budgetary allocations aimed at massive induction of equipment and technology and expansion in India's three conventional armed services, its nuclear forces on land, air, and sea, as also a dangerous reach in space. It would be accurate to conclude that these allocations and inductions keep South Asia in a perpetual st state of strategic instability. However, because Pakistan consciously will not indulge in a conventional arms race, except to seek qualitative upgrades, it is compelled to seek security and strategic stability by investing in appropriate nuclear weapons through quality, quantity, doctrines, and the concept of full spectrum deterrence. Pakistan's response of strengthening its full spectrum deterrence in an operational environment of relative conventional asymmetry is therefore apt and ensures that South Asia will remain strategically stable. A very important ingredient of the need for retention of strategic stability in South Asia is that Pakistan has ensured seamless integration between nuclear strategy and conventional military strategy in order to achieve the desired outcomes in the realms of peacetime deterrence, pre-war deterrence, as also in intra-war deterrence, if the adversary, having drawn the wrong conclusions, challenges the very foundations of the deterrence theory. <coughs> this is especially relevant today post Pulwama and Balakot, because there are people in important places in India's strategic circles who have drawn dangerously wrong conclusions about what they're referring to as Pakistan's nuclear bluff. I would like to caution that it would be a serious professional folly on their part to consider that a single airstrike, that too conducted most unprofessionally, would render Pakistan's robust nuclear deterrence a bluff. Pakistan's nuclear capability 
operationalized under the well-articulated policy of full-spectrum deterrence, comprises of a large variety of strategic, operational, and tactical nuclear weapons on land, air, and sea, which are designed to comprehensively deter large-scale aggression against mainland Pakistan. <coughs> As amply demonstrated during the February stand standoff, Pakistan's nuclear weapons continue to serve the purpose for which they were developed on a daily and hourly basis by compelling India's political and military leaders to craft a politico-military strategy, taking into consideration Pakistan's real-time nuclear capability. While developing operation plans, the Indian planners make deliberate effort to skirt around the Pakistani nuclear capability and nuclear thresholds. Official India, I hope, does not take Pakistan's nuclear capability as a bluff. It's uh, precisely the presence of these nuclear weapons that deters, and in this specific case, deterred India from expanding operations beyond a single unsuccessful airstrike. It is the full spectrum deterrence capability of Pakistan that brings the international community rushing into South Asia to prevent a wider conflagration. That India chose not to proceed further in February is a testimony to not only the humiliation it suffered at the hands of the Pakistan Air Force, but also the cold calculation that nuclear weapons would come into play sooner rather than later. That, ladies and gentlemen, is nuclear deterrence at work and not nuclear bluff. If India's strategic planners consider Pakistan's full spectrum deterrence as a bluff, whether as a professional assessment or succumb to the irrational pressures of their political masters, and proceed to undertake further military misadventures, as is being threatened at regular intervals by the highest levels of political and military leadership, South Asia, I'm afraid, is heading into a catastrophic <coughs> uncharted territory. While hoping that the Indian strategic planners will retain their professional equilibrium and will not be swayed by irresponsible and unprofessional rhetoric of politics, I would like to state in very clear terms that nuclear Pakistan resolve to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity including Azad, Jammu, and Kashmir, must never be tested. That might be the minimum lesson to take home from the Balakot Rajwadi skirmish. <coughs> Here I would like to elaborate on a few more aspects of the February 2019 skirmish on the Kashmir line of control, as these are pertinent to the larger strategic stability paradigm that we are discussing today. It has been established by independent international analysts that nuclear India's conduct of an air strike against mainland nuclear Pakistan at Balakot, driven perhaps by delusions of Israeli-style air power tactics against Syria, Lebanon, and Gaza, but disconnected from the realities of the dominant air operational environment in, in which Israel operates, was poorly planned and executed by the Indian Air Force. It was playing with fire at the lower end of the nuclear spectrum and Armageddon at the upper end. It is clear that the strategic and military consequences of an irresponsible political decision for achieving domestic, political, and electoral, electoral advantages supported by poor professional military advice were not thought through or war-gamed to their logical conclusion. If they had been, which they ought to have been, not only in the 12 days between Pulwama and Balakot, but indeed as a peacetime contingency planning for years earlier, Nuclear India should have concluded that in an active military conflict situation, especially a limited one with nuclear armed Pakistan, while it may be easy to climb the first rung on the escalatory ladder, the second rung would always belong to Pakistan. And that India's choice to move to the third rung would invariably be dangerously problematic in anticipation of the fourth rung response by Pakistan. <clears throat> also, that the escalatory rung climbing could not be so neatly choreographed, but could quickly get out of hand and morph into a major war, which perhaps nobody wanted, but whose outcomes would be disastrous for the region and the globe. This was muddled strategic thinking at its worst. In the process, it challenged the very foundation of strategic stability in South Asia, which is premised on the time-tested concept of restraint and responsibility. The strength of this foundation was put to test by India, but it had to beat a hasty retreat in the face of determined Pakistani response. Status quo ante was restored, and no new normal was established. As opposed to India's strategic recklessness, it was Pakistan's measured response at the politico-military level, deliberately avoiding blood and dead bodies, and following up with mature statesmanship that saved the day for South Asia, and by extension for the world. 
It is not difficult to imagine the political and military pressures on Pakistan if India, as it intended to, had actually killed three to 400 Pakistanis during its ill-conceived airstrike at Balakot. Or thereafter, as reports suggested, continued on a war-widening trajectory on the third night and carried out missile strikes, which the Indian Prime Minister termed colloquially as Katal Ki Rat, meaning literally the night of the murder. There are few parallels of a country possessing nuclear weapons conducting itself with greater irresponsibility than India did against another nuclear-armed country. In an oblique way, one would like to thank the Indian spice missile targeting programmers and the IEF pilots for their timely incompetence that ensured that none of the intended targets at Balakot got hit, as indeed the loss of nerve by the Indian leadership to carry on further. Keeping in view Pakistan's declared policy of quid pro quo plus against a limited Indian attack, it was surprising that India itself ended up with surprise on the quality of Pakistan's measured and successful response. As professional planners, the Indians also should have understood that from there on, the rush to a nuclear crisis was but a few steps away, and that there would be no choice for India but to step back and look for face-saving options involving international players, highlighting yet again the centrality of the core issue of Kashmir in South Asia, precisely what India has sought to avoid for decades. Paradoxically, the entire episode has succeeded in bringing the Kashmir dispute as a nuclear flashpoint front and center on the international stage ever since. This focus has been compounded further by India's inhumane lockdown in occupied Kashmir since August 2019 and the political revocation of Articles 370 and 35A. <clears throat> Continuing further, I would like to focus specifically on a few aspects of India's nuclear conduct, on India's nuclear conduct during the crisis, which not only has direct bearing on the strategic stability instability paradigm, but also provides a guide to India's strategic conduct in a future crisis. First, Mr. Modi said that he would not preserve India's nuclear weapons for the fireworks night of the Hindu festival of Diwali, implying in the most casual of manners their first use against Pakistan. This statement alone turned India's much trumpeted policy of no first use on its head. Not that Pakistan has ever viewed with any degree of credibility India's first no first use policy. Mr. Modi's pronouncement was not off the cuff. He knew exactly what he was saying in a single-minded focus to stir up an anti-Pakistan, anti-Muslim nationalistic narrative to win elections. As a consequence, however, India's formal nuclear strategy was upended single-handedly within no time. The NFU policy was further put under strain by the later day pronouncements of India's Defense Minister, Mr. Rajnath Singh. Second, added to the misadventure was the operational reality that India not only deployed in the Arabian Sea its conventional naval flotilla, including an aircraft carrier, conventional submarine that got detected but spared by the Pakistan Navy, but more importantly, the nuclear submarine Arihant presumably to deter Pakistan from contemplating the use of nuclear weapons. Arihant, which had earlier claimed running deterrence patrols in a fanfare ceremony presided over by the Prime Minister, was certainly carrying canisterized ready-to-go nuclear missiles. Since there were no credible reports of India's first strike weapons based on land and air being readied, one wonders whether India contemplated the use of nuclear weapons from a second strike platform even before its first strike options. Third. With reference to the concept of institutionalized command and control of nuclear weapons, which institutional forum authorized the deployment of a second strike platform carrying nuclear weapons? Was there a debate in a secret meeting of India's National Command Authority, because none was announced formally as it was in Pakistan? Or was this too decided in a cavalier fashion between the Prime Minister and his naval chief? Or worse still, was the Indian Navy also given a free hand, as Prime Minister Modi claimed to have given to his other military commanders? With what sense of political responsibility would a prime minister of a nuclear state single-handedly delegate authority to deploy nuclear platforms and nuclear weapons to military commanders? <clears throat> Fourth, one wonders further, whatever happened to the Cold Start Doctrine, which seemed to have taken a backseat just when the operation situation suggested mobilization. Looking at the Indian Army's deployment pattern throughout the crisis, it appears India itself did not place much faith in the Cold Start Doctrine as a credible response option. It seems obvious that India's strategic thinking stood considerably uh, confused in a moment of crisis, 
at the altar of a political party's electoral strategy. It conceded professional space to the whims of a heavyweight prime minister. And that ought to be a cause of serious concern for Pakistan when faced with a nuclear adversary. Excuse me. When faced with a nuclear adversary whose tragic thinking and actions get muddled up in a crisis. This was not only irresponsible conduct, but also institutional failure in India, raising serious questions about the future state of strategic stability in South Asia. It is not difficult to conclude from the foregoing Indian strategic conduct in a real-time crisis, as a case study as it were, that the Indian political leadership under the extremists of the BJP and RSS, led in an unfortunate gung-ho style by the chairman of India's National Command Authority, falls in the category of reckless nuclear custodians. And that the Indian military is either too meek or equally reckless to offer sound professional advice. Mr. Modi's infamous claim to have ordered the IEF to take advantage of the cloud cover to beat Pakistani radars shows the IEF as a professional force in poor light. This scenario is a chilling reflection on the functionality, or more appropriately, the dysfunctionality of the Indian command control system and the efficacy of its national command authority. For years, the international community worried about the wrongly premised narrative of Pakistan's nuclear weapons falling into the hands of religious and extremist fanatics, despite the fact that the militants remained confined to the fringes, and despite the fact that throughout the years of the militancy, the state of Pakistan continued to be ruled successively by moderate governments at the center and in the provinces. These were supported by a professionally designed command and control structure, managed by professionals who ensured the highest levels of nuclear security and responsible nuclear conduct. One finds it intriguing on the contrary that today in India and for the last six years, while extremists and religious fanatics of the RSS and BJP are the real-time state and the government at the center and in a large number of provinces and in firm control of India's nuclear weapons with a track record of strategic recklessness and irresponsibility in words and in deed, and one doesn't hear a word of concern from the same international community which had sleepless nights about an imagined extremist takeover in Pakistan. Finally, before I end, I would like to express my thoughts on the current state of strategic stability in South Asia, and also how I see things unfolding in the future in the region. Elections were held in Pakistan in 2008, we all know that, and a duly elected civilian government came into being. The government completed its five years term. Pakistan held the next election in 2013, and there was much celebration about the transfer of power from one civilian government to another civilian government through a democratic process. The nascent roots of democracy and democratic tradition, it seemed, were finally taking shape. This important milestone was reinforced in Pakistan in 2018, when yet another transition took place through the ballot box, and it is clear that democracy and transition of political path through elections is becoming an established norm, and one looks forward to 2023 for a similar democratic exercise. It is important to recall that throughout this critical period of a decade and a half, Pakistan simultaneously fought a raging militancy, terrorism and extremism through the sheer determination and sacrifices of the armed forces and the people of Pakistan, and won. On both accounts, that establishing a democratic tradition and fighting and defeating militancy, terrorism, and extremism, Pakistan has come out with resounding success and has a good story to tell. Having put these demons behind it, Pakistan is now looking forward to getting its economic act together while consolidating the two successes. Making allowance for the inevitable rough and tumble of democracy and politics, Pakistan today is stable internally and seeks its rightful place in the community of nations as a responsible international player. Unfortunately for South Asia, when we contrast the history of India during the same period, we find that it's a story of a complete reversal of the trajectory from which Pakistan has just emerged. In tourist terminology, while Pakistan can say, been there, done that, India has placed itself most enthusiastically in a position where it can only say going there and doing that. While Pakistan has moved away from the extremism and religious bigotry where fringe elements were trying to take it, and the state fought and defeated it, the Indian state 
has embraced extremism and religious bigotry head on as state policy. And when the state turns rogue, one can only hope that elements of the civil society and other saner institutions will resist, contain, and reverse the obviously societal course. The cautious optimism generated in India in the elections of 2014, which brought Mr. Modi's BJP and RSS into power, revolved around economic growth as a takeoff from Mr. Modi's performance in Gujarat. While for some years it appeared that India might achieve the perceived economic miracle, however, after the elections of 2019, the economic expectations have taken a nosedive. And what has emerged center stage in its place is the state policy of Hindutva, encompassing in its many parts religious extremism, bigotry, ultra-nationalism, anti-Pakistan, anti-Kashmiri, anti-Muslim, anti-minorities, and what have you. In short, the complete antithesis of a modern, progressive, secular state that the Indian constitution had envisaged. I can identify four major drivers of Hindustan's domestic Hindutva policies, and by extension, its policy towards Pakistan. One, Hindutva philosophy has morphed into a movement to erase the negative psychological complexes and sense of humiliation of the Hindu nation of a thousand years of Muslim rule. The Hindutva movement led by the BGP therefore seeks to marginalize and delegitimize the Muslims of India. Two, by doing so, Hindutva seeks the restoration of the perceived glory of Hindu India going back to the Vedas, Chandragupta Maurya and Ashoka of 300 BC. And hence the claims that one hears of Hindustan in the past having invented or discovered any numbers of cutting edge technologies much before the modern era. Three, the relentless pursuit of becoming a regional and global power, oblivious of its many vulnerabilities and weaknesses, drives Hindustan's quest for regional domination, particularly its relationship with Pakistan. Four, a self-delusional one-way competition with China under the guise of standing up as a Western bulwark with strategic overreach now up to the Pacific. In nutshell, the gloves are off, the mask is off, and the veneer of secularism is dead. India in 2020 is now well and truly Hindustan, of the Hindus, by the Hindus, and for the Hindus. This has been validated by the landslide victory of the BJP RSS and of the Hindutva philosophy twice in five years. <clears throat> The transformation from India to Hindustan over a period of 72 years now carries the duly stamped ownership of the vast multitudes of Hindu population which voted for the BJP RSS heavily. Most national institutions in Hindustan also seem to be in the process of succumbing to the national trend and have fallen in line. As a conclusion, I would like to determine what these developments portend for strategic stability in South Asia. Much of what is happening inside India might be considered by many in strict international terms as India's internal affair and something that is for the people of India to decide as to the national direction they wish to take. However, India's conduct in occupied Kashmir cannot be considered its internal affair from any perspective whatsoever. Pakistani, Kashmiri, or from the perspective of international law, including the relevant UN Security Council resolutions. None of these entities recognize India's right to bulldoze unilateral constitutional changes in internationally recognized disputed territory. It is clear that India's suppressive military and political actions in Kashmir have a direct bearing on strategic stability. The consequences invariably have the potential to spill over into Azad, Jammu and Kashmir through direct and indirect actions by India. It's only a matter of time before occupied Kashmir boils over. When that happens, India is likely to apply even more suppressive military measures inside occupied Kashmir and for desperate diversionary strategies on the line of control and perhaps against mainland Pakistan itself. The highest levels of India's political and military leadership have now transited in their rhetoric from dropping hints <clears throat> to outright threats of invading Azad, Jammu and Kashmir and defeating the Pakistani armed forces in seven to ten days. Yes, the Prime Minister of India and his services chiefs have actually said that forgetting in their desperation that they are talking about a robust nuclear armed Pakistan with strong and balanced conventional forces that only a year ago humiliated the Indian military. As military professionals, we look out for threat capabilities and intentions. In South Asia today, India's capabilities and intentions both are visible in the clearest of terms. Pakistan therefore plans its responses on what India is capable of 
as well as what its intentions are. There is no ambiguity here. From here on, we are in dangerously uncharted territory and strategic stability is giving way to strategic instability and that in the presence of strong conventional nuclear forces on both sides does not portend well for South Asia and the world. In my opinion, however much Pakistan may wish and call for sanity to prevail, it will invariably get sucked into a conflict not of its making, a conflict that would have been thrust upon it. And as I showed in the beginning with examples from South Asia's history, Pakistan will never hesitate in ensuring that strategic stability is not disturbed to its disadvantage. With the emerging scenario quite visible on the horizon, what would expect the international community in all its wisdom to foresee the unfolding of a catastrophic sequence of events and prevent it from happening through stronger and timely intervention and diplomacy that we have seen so far. At the very least, one would expect that today's proceedings at this very important forum of the IISS, CISS enclave would send out a strong message to the world community about the dangers lurking in South Asia and the threats to strategic stability to not only the region but to the world at large with all its dreadful and unthinkable consequences. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> General Kidwai, thank you very much. Um, that's a keynote speech of substance and certainly um, to challenge this um, audience. We now have some time for questions, about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, I'd like to start off. Um, I would say that when you put up a hand to seek to ask a question, I'll try to identify you. But could you please identify yourself when, before you actually pose the question? But let me start with the question, taking the privilege of the chair, if I may, General Kidwai, and just ask you um, a little bit more about escalation and escalation management. I mean, is, is it possible to manage escalation, or just how risky is it? You talked about second, third, fourth rungs. Um, I think there's always the worry that some of the rungs might be missing um, and you might, you, the situation might result in um, moving from rung one to rung four rather too rapidly. And in that context, you know, a phrase that you didn't use, but a phrase that is very much in the minds of those who deal with nuclear deterrence is last resort, the idea that nuclear weapons would only be used in last resort. I mean, I wonder whether you could make a comment on those things. Do you want to... yes, <laughs> Escalation and uh, escalation management, that is probably the crux of what you're asking. I would say that uh, this is something that can be managed. It's not uh, impossible. There are examples from history where nuclear powers have managed. The prime, primary example is from the US and uh, ex-USSR, or now US and Russia, and other nuclear countries. They have managed escalation. Unfortunately, the current mood in uh, the Indian politics and in the Indian polity and in the, in the military and for that matter in the in Indian diplomacy, which are all outcomes of a, a single, uh, single focus on no dialogue with Pakistan, with that kind of a cutoff in, uh, in the talking uh, uh, arena, I'm afraid it is very difficult to predict any kind of uh, escalation management. Because when two sides do not have uh, indirect channels, track two channels, track one channels, and there's a complete cutoff between the two sides, as was uh, quite evident in uh, the last, uh, as I said, as a case study, as it were, in February 2019, we have to have a management system and uh, earlier on, the, what we have been referring to for the last two decades, the strategic restraint regime, was precisely designed to uh, develop this kind of uh, confidence building measure. It's a massive confidence building measure between two sides, provided the two sides believe, or at least the major side, India, believes in some kind of confidence building measure. For 
I would say three quarters of the time of, the, of this decade that I've two decades that I've talked about, there was a uh, 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 inability on the part of India to reconcile to the fact that uh, Pakistan, because of its nuclear capability and because of the dangers inherent in the possession of nuclear capability, was uh, had equalized the situation of the conventional asymmetries. But uh, now, since the last five or seven years, since the advent of this particular uh, mood in India through two elections that we have seen, I don't see a mechanism in being put in place unless there's a, there's a major turnaround in Indian thinking. Short of that, uh, I don't see uh, escalation measure or serious CBMs coming into, into place. And uh, I'm afraid that we, if there's another crisis, we will probably lurch or list from uh, one crisis to another till a third party uh, intervenes, I probably did in, uh, in the February crisis, and uh, calmed down the situation. It's a very unhappy situation. Um, I've got a question here and uh, one over there. But... General, thank you. Antoine Levesque, Research Fellow for South Asia at the IISS. You've painted for us a rather bleak uh, picture of um, trends which you've uh, observed in uh, Indian behavior and thinking um, since the February crisis last year. I wonder if these trends uh, taken together m put greater onus on Pakistan to respond more forcefully uh, than it did last year in the event of the next crisis. Thank you. Should we take two questions? I would have yeah. missed out the essence of his. May I take that one first? Do you, do you want? You, wait, yeah. Do you want? Do you want to take that one first? Okay. Yeah. I think what you are asking is uh, some kind of uh, the prediction of a Pakistani behavior in the future, in the light of uh, Pakistan's behavior in the last crisis. I, I said very clearly that uh, Pakistan's policy in a limited conflict, I'm not talking of outright war, in a limited conflict or in a limited uh, attacks by India, the, the types that we saw uh, last year, Pakistan's policy, stated policy, is quid pro, quid pro quo plus, which amplifies very clearly that we will not take it lying down and we will get right back plus a bit. So. If that kind of a situation re-emerges in any future conflict, I don't see any reason why Pakistan would change that policy. Uh, General, thank you very much for a very interesting um, uh, commentary. Uh, I'm Tim Wilsey, former British diplomat, and now with King's College London. So you mentioned that um, after Balakot, you felt that um, no new normal had been established. That's absolutely not the view in India, as you know. They now have the view that any further terrorist attacks in, in Kashmir or anywhere else will, you know, the same playbook will be rolled out, which is a possibility of an airstrike into not just Pakistan-controlled Kashmir, but into metropolitan Pakistan uh, itself. Now, the reason the Indians were able to mount that airstrike was because they identified you know, what, what was clearly a major failing in Pakistan air defense, uh, radar coverage and so forth. And of course, that was subsequently confirmed by the fact that air, um, you know, uh, Pakistani airspace was then closed for what, two, three, mm. maybe even four months um, after that. How can you, I mean, A, I assume that loophole has been closed, but more importantly, how can you communicate the fact that that has been closed so that India does not um, identify that loophole again and that does not therefore feel that a new normal has been established? I think I said very clearly that there are very serious <coughs> wrong conclusions that have been draw drawn in the Indian planning uh, cells, in the Indian government, in the Indian military. They have drawn some very wrong conclusions. And this despite the fact that uh, whatever they did try at uh, Balakot, there's, there's been a, a, a lot of chest thumping and the media in many ways has led or misled, I think, the strategic planners into making it appear as if uh, uh, India was able to come out very successful 
through spinning, uh, I think, very false stories about the whole uh, episode, the sequence of events. When I say that no new normal was established, I mean exactly that. And that is that if India thinks, by drawing these wrong conclusions, that every terrorist, so-called terrorist attack is emanating from Pakistan, and therefore it must retaliate within a few days on Pakistan, irrespective of having investigated or find out whether it was a local phenomenon or whether it was did, actually did emerge from Pakistan. If that is going to be the pattern, then Pakistan's response options will always be what they have been. And I would like to link it with, I think, what uh, Lewis had, had asked, that if India is not learning the right lessons, and unfortunately uh, it seems that they're not learning the right, right lessons from this particular episode, and uh, rhetoric is leading, political rhetoric is leading professionalism, military professionalism. That is a, that is a, a bad story. And if there is, if situ situation do does emerge or re-emerge once again, and India decides to undertake similar operations as the, as the new normal, then there is the new normal that pa uh, Pakistan has also established. And the new normal is that we will fight it right back with a, with a bit of a plus. Thank you very much. I've got two um, questions on this table here, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Iftikhar Malik. I'm a professor of history at Botswana University and affiliated with Wolfson in Oxford. I mean, for the last 73 years, General Sir, we have seen this. I mean, the whole politics of conflict and suspicion and warfare. I mean, both sides have accusations, counter accusations. But for the interest of one-fourth of humanity, and also for the interest of Pakistani people especially, with this two active you know, war theaters in the West and in the East, aren't there any other possible means and strategies to engage India on economic front, through some other mutual friends, through I mean, we have pursued military strategies on both sides. I'm not just blaming one side. But isn't there any kind of alternative thinking that we could have a small breakthrough, some window opening for peaceful negotiations, or at least coexistence? And I mean, this will go on, but eventually we will exhaust ourselves on both sides. And as a Pakistani, I deeply worry about Pakistan with its limited resources and uh, with lots of problems that we have. And we are definitely in a very testing geopolitical environment. So my, my question is, is there any kind of thinking or planning or, <clears throat> you know, in, in Pakistan and maybe in India as well, that we could get out of this whole politics of conflict and suspicion, which has sadly featured in a very horrible way in the last 73 you are, you, years. You are a professor of history, and history teaches us that uh, peace is not a one-way process. To strike peace, first of all, you need peace of the brave. This is precisely the kind of situation which in the past there have leaderships and statesmen who have risen beyond this kind of an impasse uh, situations. In India and Pakistan, you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, this is the situation for the last 70 plus years. And from the Pakistani point of view, any number of initiatives, you can, you can list it. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs can give you a whole rundown on the kind of initiatives that Pakistan has been taking from 1947, not just talking of the current state of affairs in which we have tried to introduce the elements peace or at the minimum CBMs. But uh, there's a psyche work at work in India which is totally dismissive of uh, having some kind of an equation, of an equivalent equation with Pakistan. And with that kind of a mindset, I, I really am at a loss to understand or really loss to say as to how many more proposals can Pakistan continue to churn out. Pakistan is not a proposal churning out factory. We churn out proposal every, every second year, third year, the diplomats do their uh, work. And yet, when one side has decided, particularly this particular government, 
has decided. There have been uh, governments in the past where movement have, has taken place. <clears throat> there are examples of movements having taken place in uh, finding some kind of a reconciliation. Any number, you can go back at, in the last 15, 20 years, there have there has been movements. But then uh, suddenly there are lobbies in the Indian hierarchy, in the Indian military. They couldn't uh, reconcile to a very simple thing in Sir Creek or in Siachen almost done things which they backed off at the last minute. So this is a, the state of affairs. And for peace or a peace partner, you need a partner. Where is the partner? The partner currently particularly is in a very belligerent mood. I've got uh, one question here and two, three on that table, but go ahead. Thank you, General. Uh, Viraj Solanki, Research Associate for South Asia at the IISS. What are Pakistan's attitudes, uh, plans, and commitments towards taking nuclear weapons to sea? And for what purpose? Is this for second strike capability? Thank you. For, just repeat the last sentence. For taking uh, for nuclear weapons? To sea. And for what purpose? Is it for... Uh, ah, okay. And for, is it for second strike capability? Uh -huh, okay. Thanks. This is not new. And when this... Uh, full spectrum deterrence, credible minimum deterrence was conceived to begin with, which is two decades ago. The direction was quite clear that uh, to stabilize, while we were developing the first strike options uh, on land and air, it was very clear that uh, they would have to be stabilized by the possession of a, of a reasonable uh, second strike capability. And that is the whole purpose because, uh, as you know, we all know the deterrence theories that uh, the fundamental uh, reason is to provide disincentives to the other side by showing a weakness or showing a gap. And the moment you show a, a strategic gap, by the, for example, for, for the absence of sea-based or submarine-based uh, weapons, there is, at least theoretically, an incentive for the other side to take out your first strike options. And therefore, survival of the nuclear capability demands that there be a reliable uh, second strike capability, just in case that kind of an incentive uh, is uh, is uh, available to the adversary, and that is that is the logic. Thank you. General uh, David Kemispati, a former Quesa student and uh, now risk manager uh, consultant. Um, you mentioned the possibility of India. Um, invading uh, Pakistan administers Kashmir. I think the next drama is likely to come from an incident which leads to an escalation as a result of both sides' doctrine of quid pro quo, QPQ, uh, and therefore an escalation. And how do we break that escalation? Um, could Pakistan conceive of the idea of holding the moral gr high ground and not retaliating? taking whatever pain was, uh, you know, in India had, had, had put on Pakistan, but then freezing their retaliation and getting, mobilizing the world press, the, the United Nations, the international community to embarrass India so much that actually India is seen as uh, the warring party and Pakistan is seen as the one holding the moral high ground and therefore breaking that uh, escalation of QPQ. I'm sorry to me it sounds like a non-starter for two reasons. One, a no reaction from Pakistan would only strengthen and uh, enhance India's uh, perception that it can hit and get away. And Pakistan would not retaliate. That is at the politico-military level within South Asia. And can you imagine if Pakistan had not responded in February, what would have been the degree of uh, arrogance and further wrong conclusion being drawn in India, which they have drawn anyway despite Pakistan's uh, retaliation, strong retaliation. So for uh, military reasons, political reasons, it is, uh, I think, no a non-starter that Pakistan will just take the pain and not retaliate. And if uh, experience has shown very clearly on whose side uh, 
the international community is, United Nations Security Council resolutions, uh, and many other initiatives which Pakistan has asked for from the international community to intervene. Even in the current situation, you can see how much intervention is being done by the international community. The Kashmir lockdown is going, has now entering its sixth or seventh month, and there's a completely inhuman situation. And uh, what has the international community contributed to removing this, the pain of the Kashmiris and the, the, the issue that Pakistan is raising? So on both accounts, I think, reliance on international community, I think it's a non-starter. And no retaliation by Pakistan also is a non-starter. So uh, I'm sorry, I won't agree on both, both accounts. Um, I think we're going to have to um, close this, the, the list shortly. I've got two more on that table and two more at the back. Um, we've got a lady, I think, with the microphone. Thank you. I'm Saima Mansal. I'm a senior research officer in Center for International Strategic Studies, Islamabad. Um, Jan Saab, partly in reference to what David has already talked about, um, there's this larger um, narrative that has been going around in the world that, uh, which has been portended by many states, that it is Pakistan that is the revisionist state. But if we look at the three levels of analysis, uh, starting from the global level where India has global ambitions, uh, to make it space uh, in the UNSC and all. And if we look at the regional level, it now is threatening us of taking on, through military means, the Azad Jammu and Kashmir, rather than talking about diplomatic means. And if we talk about the state level, we see the secular India reverting back to Hindutva and you know these sort of ideologies. <coughs> Um, why is the world not coming to terms with the fact that there is this dangerous situation that's emerging in our neighborhood? And when there are incidents like people being killed in Shaheen Bagh, uh, point blank by Hindutva terrorists with the, um, with the, milit with the uh, police forces standing with their hands tied at the back, uh, how does it portend for these, uh, the safety of the, on the, the security of a state with nuclear weapons? Thank you. But, but, but you made a statement. What exactly is the question? What do you want me to answer? Is the, why is the world not ready to come to terms with the fact? Because, I mean, why, why I mean there's this situation that's going to come to boil at some point. Uh, you've already talked about the Kashmir lockdown uh, having big months now. I think the world has, uh, for one, they have enough problems elsewhere. And uh, right now, perhaps the tipping point in Kashmir for the world may not have reached because there's no violence, there's a one-sided violence, there's a one-sided suppression. Like I said, if Kashmir boils over, and there's a serious, uh, let's say hypothetically, there's a serious uprising, and there is a danger of Pakistan getting sucked into it, and leading eventually to some kind of a nuclear, uh, you know, uh, match off, maybe the international community will come running, like did probably in February. But that, again, will be basically to calm things down. I think it is, it is uh, the interests of the international community are coinciding for the last uh, many decades now with India's national interests. And when there's convergence of interests of uh, international players and one side, uh, that's the kind of position that the international community will continue to take. This is the reality of life that we have to uh, understand. In the real world, uh, unless the, it is the people of Kashmir who have to, like I said, if they bring a situation to the tipping point, then maybe the international community might be alarmed. As of now, uh, I think they are quite comfortable with the way this six months have passed, and for that matter, the 72 years have passed with the status quo. A quick questions, quick response. Um, one here and one with a chat with the shirt at the back. Uh, <laughs> ben Barry from the IISS. General, thank you for the clarity and candour of your remarks. Do you see any scope for transparency or confidence building measures that could be applied in the current environment? For example, it's sometimes been suggested that older generations of missiles could be retired by both sides. Do you want to take another question or do you want to answer them one by one? No, no, no. I, I, I can answer that. You need a partner. Where is the partner for these CBMs? If we had a partner, we could carry on discussions on these kind of measures. But uh, I'm sorry, there's a partner missing. So unilateral 
uh, actions Pakistan will not take unless technology demands, which it's, a, it's a something with internally that we can decide. We don't need a particular missile and we want another missile or another weapon system or something. That is for our own internal, by, through our own internal assessments. But if you are talking of uh, missile uh, retirements through uh, confidence building, uh, you know, engagements between the other side, you need a partner to do that. And as, the, as we all know, as of now, uh, that partner is missing in action. <coughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, Carl Dewey from King's College London. Uh, I'll keep it quick. Um, you mentioned three types of missiles or weapon systems, so tactical, operational, and strategic. I was just wondering if you could clarify what you mean by operational. What does this capability look like? Um, how, what did missiles look like? How large are the warheads? When do you see them? What types of targets do you see them being used against? And where does this fit on the escalation ladder? So. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't quite got his question. What is that? Asking about targeting the RPGs. Yeah. About? What kind of missiles are uh, categorized as operational? And uh, what kind of target they, they will be in there? What's the okay, okay, I got it. First of all, it's an operational question. It's an operational question which uh, I, I, I wouldn't like to dilate upon it. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, we all know the definitions. In the, in the military terms, we know the definitions of what is strategic, what is operational, and what is tactical. There are three categories, and that is, the, uh, that is being covered by what we are calling the full-spectrum deterrence, uh, including the three crime ranges. But these, of course, when you say strategic, operational, and tactical, these are specific to the South Asian environment. It is not uh, what the U.S. and Russia might think is strategic. is not strategic here. But these are based on ranges that cover a certain uh, relevant piece of uh, target targets that we, we think. So the full spectrum deterrence uh, policy that Pakistan has defined for itself is very clear that we have a strategic, uh, we have a vertical uh, strategic operational and tactical <coughs> weapon systems. And broadly speaking, these are defined in terms of operations unfolding as we understand in military strategy. And uh, then, of course, there's a horizontal uh, balancing in full-spectrum deterrence, which is based on the land, air, and sea uh, systems. So vertically and horizontally, the full-spectrum deterrence quite defines the categories of weapons. Uh, beyond that, I think it would, I would be going into operational matters, which is not at... Uh, I've got a final question, and I'm sorry, we're going to have to close. There's a chap at the back. Um, there we are. You identified yourself correctly. Yes, Ali Arsalan Pasha, University of Oxford. General, thank you so much for speaking. Uh, my question is about nuclear posturing. Uh, in DGISPR's speech on 4th of September, uh, he highlighted the conflict and security spectrum, saying that nuclear weapons or nuclear warfare is one of the options that we can take. Just a month after that, Rajnath Singh, India's defense minister, said that the no first use policy may be need to be revised. Uh, can we assume that bringing the nuclear weapons to the forefront is the new normal now? Or do you see Prime Minister Khan's diplomatic uh, efforts uh, to be achieving some sort of success? I am not sure whether you are quoting the DGISPR correctly. I don't think he mentioned uh, the bringing forth the use of nuclear weapons. He did mention one the, uh, that nuclear countries were to the effect that they should not, uh, they should be behaving or conducting them with greater responsibility, nuclear armed countries. But whether he actually, uh, could you quote exact word that he said? Uh, yes, he uh, highlighted five options that we could take and one of them was nuclear warfare. So uh, he didn't rule it out completely. That's that, that the theory of it. There's, there no, it doesn't indicate any kind of a policy. If you have a whole menu of options uh, in a given situation, those menus start from uh, actions on the line of control and they go all the way up to, uh, to the nuclear option. So there's no big deal in the, if the GG aspect you're quoting correctly in saying that. Mr. Rajnath Singh had simply followed up what his prime minister did and this, there's been a debate. It was not, uh, neither of the two statements were off the cuff, in my judgment, not uh, Mr. Modi and not Mr. Rajnath Singh, because this debate has been going on in India for uh, quite, quite, quite some time in their international diaspora as well as in the local uh, uh, strategic community about doing away with the NFU policy. 
But uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, I said here, and I've said it again and again, Pakistan has never believed in the NFU policy to begin with. So when we don't believe in a policy, it doesn't make a difference to Pakistan whether it's an NFU or no NFU. In any case, if you know their nuclear doctrine, there are any number of uh, situations in which they themselves have identified exceptions in uh, using the nuclear weapons first in, in a variety of situations. So right now, even the Indian nuclear doctrine is a bit of a hodgepodge of NFU and FU. And if the two uh, senior uh, political leaders hint that they want to do away with it, it's very much within their right and their jurisdiction to do that. It makes no difference to Pakistan. General, thank you very much. I'm going to, there are many more questions um, that would, could be posed, and I'm going to call a halt now in the interests of a short coffee break. Uh, thank you very much for your um, keynote speech. It's stimulated lots of thinking, lots of questions. Um, you've answered comprehensively a whole range of, of um, points uh, put to you, and I'm sure there are lots more that can be, um, will, the, that conversation can continue. Um, but let me close by saying thank you very much, and if we could um, together say thank you to General Kidwai for his thank contribution. You.